All righty. Well, last week we looked at how in, in the midst of all the activity around her, Mary treasured and pondered all these things in her heart. She thought deeply about the meaning of everything that, that, that had happened. And, and last week, I encouraged you to treasure and ponder the deeper meaning of every aspect of the Christmas season, from the carols we sing to the candy canes that we put in our stockings. I, I encourage you to do this, because if you'll look for Christ everywhere, you'll find him everywhere. Today, I want to kind of continue along those lines. I wanna, and I want to talk to you a little bit more about how we can reach out to other people. In 1969, Kurt Kaiser and Ralph Carmichael collaborated on a youth musical called Tell It Like It Is. It was written to get young people involved in the church by, by presenting, by having music that they would relate to. It was a very popular musical and one of the first of many that was geared specifically towards you. And, and it's what really helped usher in the popularity of the youth choir in churches way back when, back in that day. And as they were looking at everything that they had written, they realized that they needed, they really wanted some kind of a closer, a modern day, just as I am type of hymn. And, and Mr. Kaiser relates this story. On a Sunday night, I was sitting in our den by the fireplace where there were the remnants of a fire, and it occurred to me that it only takes a spark to get a fire going. And then the rest of the song came very quickly. My wife suggested that I should say something about shouting it from the mountaintops, and that ended up in the third verse. It took only about 20 minutes to write the lyrics. Afterwards, my wife and I went for a walk, letting the song ruminate in our minds. That's how the song Pass It On came about. I don't know if you're familiar with that song. Let me read you the first verse. It only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God's love once you've experienced it. You spread his love to everyone you want to pass it on. On the night of the first Christmas, after Mary had given birth to her son in a stable, the news was proclaimed, not to priests, not to politicians, not to leaders of commerce, but to a group of, of nomadic minimum wage workers who were, who were on the lowest rung of the socioeconomic ladder. They were working the midnight shift, watching their sheeps in the fields. And an angel came to them and said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to men. For unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then what do those shepherds do? Well, they did what any of us would have done. They went to see for themselves. The Bible says that they hurried off and found Joseph and Mary and the baby lying in a manger. But it's what happens next that makes all the difference in the world. What was it that they did after that? They passed it on. Look at Luke 2, verses 17 and 18. 
Luke 2, verses 17 and 18. It says, after seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. These two simple verses contain the secret to turning Christmas upside down, to turning your life upside down, to turning the world upside down. They contain the secret to how you and me and all of us together can be world changers and city changers and neighborhood changers, workplace changers and family changers. And you know what that secret is? We need to pass it on. We need to spread the word just like the shepherds did. We need to tell others about what we've heard with our own ears, what we've seen with our own eyes, and what we've experienced in our own lives so that others' responses will be like those who listen to the shepherds. They'll be amazed at what we tell them. I believe that God wants us to approach not only Christmas, but, but the coming year with a let's pass it on kind of mindset. There are three things that I want to say about this to encourage you and inspire you to try doing this for yourself. First of all, I want you to realize that anyone can do it. I think it's extremely significant that God didn't choose to announce the birth of his son to members of the royal family, but to regular working class folks. The first human voices to proclaim the birth of Christ were what we would call today lower class. And yet they were considered worthy of that kind of a task. God has a history of using ordinary people. King David, before he was a king, was also a shepherd. His father had several sons, and everyone considered David to be the runt of the litter. And yet God used David in an extraordinary way. Nehemiah was a Babylon slave. His job was to taste the king's food before the king did, so that if it was poisoned, Nehemiah would die instead of the king. He had disposable written into his job description. And yet God used this ordinary slave in an extraordinary way. When Nehemiah heard that the wall of Jerusalem was a pile of rubble, he was able to get permission from the king to begin a rebuilding project that not only restored the city of Jerusalem, but led to revival breaking out in the whole kingdom. Peter was an uneducated fisherman, prone to saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. He could be considered something of a coward and a quitter as well. But God was able to use this ordinary fisherman in an extraordinary way. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached, and 3,000 people came to Jesus. God also used Peter to bring healing to a whole lot of folks who were sick. I was thinking this week about some people who had had an impact or were influential in my life when I first became a Christian. One was a man named Mr. Dennis, Charlie Dennis. He, he, he was my Sunday school teacher when I was in the fifth and sixth grade. And then when I moved up to junior high, he moved with us. Mr. Dennis wasn't a deacon in the church. He didn't have any other jobs or positions that I was aware of at that age in the church. He worked at Learjet 
on second shift as a mechanic. You know who else worked second shift at Learjet? My father. Mr. Dennis would teach us faithfully in Sunday school. He'd plan things for, for all of us boys to do together. He tried to teach us world skills when he'd take us camping or, or go over to his, to his house and just tinker with tools and, 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 and fixing stuff that he probably broke just so that we could fix it. But I know that he also talked regularly with my dad about me and my two older brothers, who he had also taught. Because through the years, he had taught all three of us. And there were so many others. Ray Emery, Ron Proct, Sam Smith. They, they all helped to guide me towards listening to God and following his leadership in surrendering to the ministry. Ever since I was young, there have been people who have had a huge impact on my life. And many of them never even knew it. And God can use you in the same way. There are so many people who define themselves with the word just. I'm just a plumber. I'm just a nurse. I'm just an accountant. Or I'm just a cop. Or I'm just a retired old person. What can God possibly do through me? Well, the answer is that the more ordinary you are, the more extraordinarily he can use you. He can use anyone. And that brings me to the second thing that I want you to see. If you want to live with a pass it on mindset, all you need to do is tell others what you have seen and heard and experienced. Anyone who aspires to write has been given the advice, write what you know. You can't write a believable legal thriller unless you're familiar with jurisprudence. It would be impossible to write a book about baseball if you didn't know the difference between a double header and a double play. If you're going to be effective as a writer, you need to write about what you know. And in the same way, in order to be effective as a Christian, you need to approach it from the same direction. Tell what you know. Tell what you've seen. Tell what you've experienced. Throughout my years in ministry, I've heard a lot of stories about how God has miraculously changed people's lives. And many of what, of what people have related to me are truly inspiring. Yet when they're asked to share their story to the church, they decline, saying, well, I'm not a preacher. I can't preach a sermon. The problem is that they weren't asked to preach a sermon. They were just asked to share their story, to tell what God has done for them. One day, Jesus healed a man who was blind. Normally, this would be considered a good thing. But the religious people didn't like it because Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath. The religious leaders were very strict about keeping the Sabbath. One of the Sabbath rules was that the Sabbath was supposed to be a day of rest. 
That meant you couldn't work in any way. And healing somebody was considered work. Therefore, in their opinion, Jesus committed a sin by healing a blind man because he did it on Sunday. Now, not to get off the subject here, but isn't it crazy how some folks are able to, to, to distort the word of God to such an extent that they make it a sin to do good to others? This wasn't just a first century kind of phenomenon. It happens today as well. And we need to be on guard for that kind of religious legalism. Wherever you hear it, whether it's from a pulpit or whether you feel it and hear it in your own heart. But after Jesus healed this man, the religious leaders began to interrogate him, asking him what he had to say about Jesus. Was Jesus a sinner? Was he a prophet? What would this former blind man say? Look at what his response to the Pharisees was. In John 9, verse 25, he said, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. That's what the world around us needs to hear. There are so many people, both inside the church and outside the church, who think that the Christian mission only involves telling the rest of the world what they're doing wrong and how they need to change. That's not what they need to hear from us. Our message to others should be about what we have seen and heard and experienced. If you want others to know that God is real, you need to be able to tell from your own experience how he is real in your own life. So that's my challenge to you. Not only at Christmas, but for the coming year as well. As often as as you have the opportunity, tell the people you're with something good about God, something good that he's done in your life or in the life of someone that you know. Through the phenomenon of social media, we have the opportunity to engage in conversations every day with hundreds of people. And it amazes me how many believers use this opportunity to only complain about what's wrong in the world? Now, granted, there are times when negative news needs to be posted, when there are things that are urgent. But oftentimes, people are complaining just to complain. And, and, and there's nothing that anybody can do about it except to complain. And it's a shame that so many are wasting the opportunity to encourage others and to glorify the name of the Lord. We need to make it a habit to speak good about God at every opportunity. Here's a good verse to live by in Isaiah 63, 7. This is in the contemporary English version. It says, I will tell about the kind deeds the Lord has done. They deserve praise. And they do. God can use ordinary old you. I use old, not, never mind in an extraordinary way when you're willing to tell others what you've seen and heard and experienced in your relationship with him. And that brings me to the third thing that I want you to see about living with a pass it on kind of mindset. 
It only takes a spark. A simple, uplifting word can make all the difference in the world. I went online and began looking for situations where what people said or did made an, a lasting impact on someone else. I found a couple of stories. I was 13 years old trying to teach my six-year-old sister how to dive into a swimming pool from the side of the pool. It was taking quite a while as my sister was really nervous about it. We were at a big public pool and nearby there was a woman, about 75 years old, slowly swimming laps. Occasionally, she would stop and watch us. Finally, she swam over just when I was really putting the pressure on trying to get my sister to, to try the dive. And my sister was shouting, but I'm afraid. I'm so afraid. The old woman looked at my sister, raised her fist defiantly in the air, in the air, and said, so be afraid and then do it anyway. That was 35 years ago. And I have never forgotten it. It was a revelation. It's not about being unafraid. It's about being afraid and doing it anyway. And then I found this story. When I was 38, I contemplated beginning a two-year associate's degree in radi radiography. I was talking to a friend and had almost talked myself out of doing it. And I said, I'm just too old to start that. I'll be 40 when I get my degree. My friend said, if you don't do it, you'll still be 40, but without a degree. I'm nearly 60 now and that degree has been the difference between making a decent living and struggling to get by. I would imagine if we opened up this time, many of you could share about how a kind word, how, how somebody said something to you that had, had a dramatic impact on you and I know that because I know you all and I know the kind of impact you all have on people you all are aware or most of you are aware of the situation with my oldest child when we came to this church I was very open with y'all, told you what was going on. When Griff moved in with us, moved back from New Mexico and moved in with us, we invited her to come to some dinners when we were having our Sunday night dinners every month. Whereas before, there's no way in the world Griff would ever have stepped into a church. Because I tried to encourage Griff to do that, to find a church someplace. And Griff told me, whenever I even think about going into church, I just... I just have so much anxiety. Yeah, I know that Satan is trying to keep Griff from going into a church. But Griff came here and went to our dinners. And you all knew Griff. You knew the situation.
Yule Tree Grip. With so much love and grace. And I know that your acceptance of where Griff was right then meant something. Griff now works at a bakery in Nacogdoches. It is a Christian owned bakery. Griff has started, Griff has always been very artistic about anything Griff wanted to do artistically, Griff could do. And Griff has started sewing now, wants to make some of their own clothes. And for Christmas, we got sent a, you know, an Amazon wish list kind of a thing, you know, has five million things on it, none of which we can buy. But one of the things on there was a, what are those called? The, the dummies that you work on. Ladies, what are those called? Mannequin. That's it. That you pin the stuff to and everything. Ask for one of those. And it's female. Griff has started wearing I started learning makeup again. And I think the love that you all showed along with the prayers that I know you all have been making on Griff's behalf is having an effect. I feel like the sermon I was kind of preaching to the choir But I know you all know how to be encouraging to people who are not a part of this congregation. And I encourage you to keep doing it because it does have an effect. It does make a difference. Zig Ziglar once said, you never know when one kind act or one word of encouragement will change a life forever. It only takes a spark, just one spark of God for him to use an ordinary person in an extraordinary way. I think what I want for myself and for you all as well is to go beyond yielding to the Christmas spirit that comes around every December and let us yield instead to the spirit of Christ who is active in our lives 
365 days a year. I want us to learn to think deeply about Christ's presence all around us. Because as we saw last week, when you look for Christ everywhere, you'll find him everywhere. And I want us to learn to pass it on. To say something good about God at every opportunity. To inject a word of encouragement or hope in every conversation. So that God can take our ordinary lives and use them in an extraordinary way. Take out your prayer sheets, if you would.